Today, this conference will now be recorded. Okay. <laughs> Today we have Chad Sizemore, managing partner from ICS Cyber Management. Chad came to Rotary and spoke. Uh, I think that was last year, wasn't it, Chad? Yeah, I believe it was. Yep, that sounds right. Yeah, you scared me to death, and so, <laughs> so naturally I wanted to bring him in so he could, you know, share the love and scare all of you a little bit. But as a small business owner, I can tell you the topic of cybersecurity is never far from my mind. And so today he's going to share some tips and tricks with us on how we can stay faced, stay safe in this new techno world that we're living in. So thank you again for coming and I will be on mute if you need me. I will answer any questions I can. Awesome. I appreciate y'all having me. So um, number one, I don't want to scare anyone. So that's definitely not the goal of the meeting today. So um, the, you know, our philosophy is understand the risk, understand how you can mitigate those risks. Um, for the best possible price that you can, but also understand how those risks can happen and what the effects could be. So uh, real quick on us, um, we were founded, our mission is to um, provide compliance and cybersecurity solutions services to companies of all size, uh, with a major focus on small to medium, uh, because we identified a specific risk or a specific region of business that couldn't afford the twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month that that some of the, the other competitors charge, right? So we automated things as much as we could uh, to bring our price point down. So I literally have um, startup companies that have two people in them. I have all the way up to county governments, um, insurance companies, and hospitals. So we scale from literally two people all the way up to enterprise. But um, and then just briefly for myself, I grew up in Gadsden. My mother was a teacher here. I love it here. Uh, she still lives here. My aunt was a high school tennis coach here. So it's real personal for me um, coming home to have this conversation, right? So I don't want the news to be, here's a company in Gadsden that, you know, is locked up with ransomware and they can't, you know, perform business. So very personal for me, very happy to be here. So real quickly, um, breach notification law, 2018. Has anybody heard of it? Of the couple of people here in the room, y'all heard of that, or anyone on online as well. So two years ago, our state did a great thing, which was pass a breach notification law, which basically says, um, if you have a breach, you are required to um, notify, or first of all, understand that it's happened, stop it. If it's affected customers, notify those customers. If it's affected as you can see, more than a thousand individuals, you're actually supposed to let the state know. My issue with that is we do these speeches, I see new customers, I see you know people in the street, nobody's heard of it, right? So we did a great thing in passing it, but we've done a horrible thing in not letting the public know, not letting customers know, not letting the businesses know. So um, real slow to be adopted, but the law is there. So why is that important? Because if you do have a breach and you do get yourself in trouble, there is a possibility these these penalties could be levied against you. So just wanna make sure that that's made aware of. So what is a breach, right? So we hear that on the news, we hear it everywhere. Oh, somebody's been breached. This company's been breached. You've lost your data because of this breach. What is a breach? An authorized acquisition of data in electronic form, which is sensitive, protect, uh, protected, or confidential data, right? So that's a lot of mouthfuls, but basically my ability to break into your network and steal data that you should have protected or it should be private for me. A couple different types of breaches. I wanted to hit on three key ones. Uh, the first one is a virus, right? So we all know we've heard the word virus for, for ages now, right? Since we've all grown up in this industry. Um, it's malicious code written to alter the way a computer operates. That doesn't mean that it's going to shut your computer down. It could be something that's sitting there running and collecting data on your computer, on your network, right? So that's typically what a virus is. It could lay dormant, right, until 
a specific tongue or a specific code is executed for it to then cause its harm. Malware. Malware is another one that's big in the news right now, right? So what is malware? Think of it basically as a virus, but it wants to do specific damage to your network. So I come in and then I want to lock up files. I want to delete systems. I want to delete files, cause you as much havoc as possible through as many different devices as possible. And finally, the, my favorite is ransomware, right? So again, this one's in the news all the time. Uh, we'll talk about some specific things that have happened in the um, state specifically over the last year, but what does ransomware do? It uses malware and virus to infect your systems to basically learn your network, and then at a specific time, it will lock up all of your files. So what happens then, right? So typically, the ransom people will say, you have this long to give me a ransom or a fee, and you have to decide, can I afford the downtime, can I afford the fee that they're wanting, and then am I really gonna get my files back, right? So that's, that's three big questions that you have to answer yourself. So just a quick example, this is what um, some types of ransomware could look like, right? So if you have a, uh, an event happen and a ransom lock, when you try to open one of your files, this is something that you would probably see. Um, not a good day in anybody's lives if you see this, right? So um, quickly, how can a breach occur? So unknowingly giving away password, account access. So this is talking about phishing, scamming, or spamming, spyware, and the biggest weakness that is in every single organization, and that's us, the people, right? So do I click on something that I'm not supposed to? Did I open an email I wasn't supposed to? Um, it's real simple for me to sit up here and preach that, right? But in real life situations, you're going through the day, you're trying to get things done, it's real easy to play on the people to get them to click on something. So that's why this always is one of the biggest keys to understanding. So quick example, um, if you've been in any of these meetings here that we've done in the chamber before, I use this one quite a bit. Um, this, is a, this is a real email, so it looks like it came from US Bank. Um, seems really great, but if you look at what I have circled, the, the from, right, is lehigh.edu, right? So that should tell you, even if it says US Bank, or even if it says it's coming from Belt, right? Make sure you know that's really coming from who you think it's coming from. And I'm gonna give you, it's a little bit of an eye chart here, but I wanna give you a very specific example of a customer we just picked up, okay? Um, very small customer, they do a lot of business, but. 20, 25 employees. Um, I don't want to give a lot of their information away, but they have a three letter acronym. So we'll say abcinc.com, okay? They get an email from abclnc.com. Same president name, same letterhead, everything. But the user didn't pay very close attention, clicked the link, it said, hey, we need to pay this invoice. She proceeded, and luckily she had something click in her mind that thought, something's not right here, right? So she stopped before they made a payment, but she had clicked a link that was in the email, so they actually did have an infection that we had to come in and, and kind of work through. But the reason I show you this is, this is an example I found of Bank of America. So if you take a look, and again, this is an eye chart, but if you look on the right-hand side, Look at the way they spell the different characters, right? So you see um, some foreign characters for the N's or the A's. So very small, subtle changes that you might get that email and think, okay, yeah, this is legitimate, but it actually isn't, right? So um, as technology gets better, as we in the security industry get better, so are the hackers, right? Because these guys, that's all they do. So it it becomes harder and harder and harder. So one thing that we suggest for your email systems, and maybe a lot of you already have this, 
but you can actually have a bar at the top of any incoming email that says, caution, this email originated outside of your network. So what is that, what that should do is if that, if I get an email from Dale, I should see, well, Dale's from outside my network, are you sure this is a legitimate user, right? So always pay attention to that, and then at the very top, always make sure that the from is who it should actually be coming from. So again, I go back to my abcinc.com instead of abclnc.com. If you hover over the from name, you'll always see that, who it's actually coming from. That makes sense? Okay, any questions? Okay. Another big one right now is, so I'm still hitting on spamming. Another big one is what's in the news, right? So obviously in this crazy time, everybody's waiting for a vaccine, waiting for a cure, or waiting for you know somebody to fight in the streets over something, right? So be very cautious of the emails that you get in and don't just take the click. Right? So they know they're playing on our emotions that we're super sensitive right now. We all want that information as late as, as quick as we can get it. So that's a good one to always make sure that, that you're aware. <clears throat> Last thing on, on email type systems. I love this site. Um, weird name. It's haveibeenpawned.com. So take a note of this one. Uh, I think you're going to share this presentation. So that URL will be uh, in this presentation. But what this will do is allow you to enter any email address that you have used, have used in the past in that box, you hit the button, and it'll tell you if your email address has been part of a known breach. If you're on Facebook, I can guarantee you whatever email address you've used is gonna be on there. They had a couple hacks with some marketing companies a couple years ago, so those will show up. But what that will do is give you the opportunity to know, okay, if I'm using my Gmail account to log into Facebook and it's hacked, and I use my, that same Gmail account to log into Verizon for my cell phone, and those passwords are the same, you need to change those passwords. Uh, we have seen several uh, situations where a Facebook account got hacked, and I use my Gmail email for that. Those guys are good enough. At that point, they can read your emails. They see I'm a Verizon user. Then I'm gonna go to the Verizon site and just test. Does that email address and password work in Verizon? If you don't have two-factor authentication on, they're in your Verizon account. They're in your Verizon account, then they lock you out of your Verizon account, right? So it gets really bad really quick. So try, if you can, to have different passwords, different systems. I'm up here preaching that. I don't follow that, right? So I'm a biggest offender um, because we all hate passwords. So one thing I use uh, is a paid app called LastPass. Um, it's a secure encrypted uh, password saving system. They have a free version. The paid version is, I think, like $30 or $40 a year. I pay it. My wife pays it. And I'll just leave it at that. I'm not promoting their company or anything like that. But it's very good. They've got an app on your phone. So um, it's very good. If you're going to use an application like that, that password needs to be super nasty. I mean, it needs to be as long as you can get. I mean, if you need to write it down and put it in your wallet, that's fine, but it needs to be super long, okay? Any questions? Okay, uh, another way a breach can occur, um, weak access controls. So what does that mean, right? So um, you have to have a firewall. I don't care how small your company is, if you do not have a firewall, you have no protection, right? So it is no windows or doors on your house and anybody can come in with, with ease, right? So a lot of the AT&Ts, the Comcast, uh, Xfinity, things like that will provide you a small firewall built in into your modem. You're a business, you need an actual firewall, okay? Um, I cannot stress that enough. You need to have either a staff, yourself, or a third party company that does some type of management on that so that it's updated, so that you have some type of idea of the logs that are coming out of it, and they can do what's called geofencing, right? 
So if you're not doing business in China, you shouldn't have any Chinese IP addresses trying to enter your network. So they can put what's called a geofence up, select the countries that will not allow communication in. Highly recommend that. While I'm preaching that point, if you have a third party vendor and they're doing a managed firewall for you, that means they're managing that firewall. That means they're keeping it up to date. If there's something big going on with it, they're responsible for it. That does not mean that they're monitoring that 24 seven to say, hey, Will, you've got something outbreaking in this, in the chamber office that's trying to talk out. We think you've got a, a virus. That's not what they're being paid for. So we always like to make sure that we make that point too. Unless they specifically say we're providing security services, that's where that line is drawn. So we, we see a lot of customers that are, that have the kind of the false sense of security that Oh, I've got a managed firewall. Everybody's, you know, taking care of it for me. That's typically not the case. So. Patch and secure, uh, especially bring your own device. So two and three kind of go hand in hand with, with Wi-Fi as well. So if you allow your customers, your guests, um, or even personal devices to connect to your wireless, split it out. Split it to guest wireless and and professional wireless, right, or, or business wireless. So that if I come in with my cell phone and say, hey, Will, can I get on the internet? Yeah, connect, here you go. And I've got something going on on that phone or this laptop. Well, then guess what? I just brought it to you, right? So we, we talk about this virus junk all the time, right? So it's the same exact print. Um, and really I hit three, four, and five, I guess. So. And then access permissions granted to specific job functions, right? If I'm an engineer, I shouldn't have access to accounting files, right? Or if I'm a janitor, I shouldn't be able to get into the HR system, right? So make sure that who is on your network only can access what they should be able to access. Technical and architectural vulnerabilities. So uh, zero day attacks is what the industry calls this. So this is operating systems and applications that need patching. So if you see this list here on number one, if you've got a Windows 2000 system, you've got an XP system. This year, especially Windows 7, Windows 7 went end of life last year. So it's been a tremendous amount of work, time and cost on every business to upgrade those systems, right? So what we run into is, okay, well, Chad, I've got a Windows 7 system, but I've got an application that my business relies on that's not compatible with Windows 10. What do I do? Okay, couple things. Um, if you can take it off the network, that's great. If you can't, at least restrict its ability to get to the internet. So that may be tough. If, if a user has to use that and get to the internet, but if you can do it that way, that's fine. If those two options don't work, don't allow them to use Windows Explorer because the Explorer is not being updated on seven. Put Chrome or Firefox on there so you're at least getting some patches on that box. You're not protected, but until you can budget to upgrade whatever application may need to be upgraded, that's a safe option. Uh, again, patching software. So our philosophy is, we actually had a customer tell us this and I told her I was gonna steal it and I always have. So it's, I don't know what I don't know, right? So one of the things that we stress is asset discovery and what's running on every asset. So that's the first thing that we do, whether we have a full-time customer or whether we're just doing a risk assessment. Here's the devices on your network. Here's every application running on them and their patch rate. So that you know, um, oh man, I've got a, you know, I've got an application running that A, I shouldn't, or B, is way old, it needs to be updated, and for some reason it hasn't. Um, one point to make on OS patching and application patching, if you have a third party vendor that does that for you, okay, if you see one of my reports and, and you're behind some patches, don't go throwing rocks at them because there's a there's a ton of things that could happen, right? So user could say, no, I don't want that update right now. Computer could be off. There's a million things that could happen that don't allow that update to happen. But if I come in and you haven't been patched in a year, then I have to look at you and say, 
you may not be getting your money's worth, right, from whatever vendor you use. And so keep keep those things in mind. Open and secure access into your network. Um, so this kind of goes back to the firewall, to a possible vendor that's accessing your network insecurely. One of the things in our business that we haven't, that I didn't anticipate when we started is vendor management. And I'm actually gonna talk about this a little bit more in the next slide, but um, you have a vendor that's gonna take care of a service for you, take care of a system for you. You need to make sure you understand how they're accessing your network to take care of that system. So I can't tell you how many times I've seen uh, insecure methods of communication there. Um, in one case, one of our counties was using a tag system from a vendor and they were using some freeware software to access that system. I could see 10 other counties in the state, right? So why is that important? Well, this county is spending a lot of money to do everything they can do to protect themselves. But if county number two doesn't care and they get something, well, guess what I got? I got a free door coming in that it's going to be very hard to see that until it's too late. So uh, things to take account of. And as I said, so kind of beat up on that a little bit. Um, cloud. How many people think if I've got my application in the cloud, I'm safe? Right. For the most part, most vendors that have cloud services will give you um, proof that they're doing everything they can do to protect your system, right? but you still access that system from this device, right? So if I've got something on your network or you've got patches that are missing or you've clicked an email and I'm on the system, well, guess what? Now I'm in your cloud application, right? So don't, we also see the false sense of security that, oh, it's in the cloud, we're good. Not necessarily. So just, just take those things into account. Again, I'll beat up on vendors, um, make sure you know how they access your systems, have it in writing. Uh, we use the term BAA because we have a lot of medical customers, so business associate agreement basically is all that's saying. So you know that they're doing everything they can to keep you safe and, and ask them once a year, hey, have you had a risk assessment done? Do you have proof that, that you don't have any problems in, in your network? Any questions? So wanted to give a few stats. So one thing I wanna get across, when we go to smaller cities and counties, right? Or I talk to a smaller business, I get a lot of, I'm in a town, Alabama. How are they gonna know about me, right? Nobody knows about me. Um, to a hacker, it's an IP address. So there's a software that can scan the internet, find IP addresses that are easy targets, and then they go to work to try to, to expose yourself. So don't think, I'm in a small town, I have a small business, you know, nobody's gonna find me or care about me. That's very, very incorrect. So real quick, um, these are 2019 stats. So over 6,000 documented companies were impacted. That's a keyword documented, right? Because there are many, many more that either started over or had good backups that they could restore from a backup and just didn't report, right? So, um, but 6,000 is a number from the US alone in one year that we're impacted. Seven, over seven, almost seven, eight billion records exposed. Cost is estimated at seven and a half billion. I think that's probably low. I mean, it's amazing the cost of what you're gonna have to go through if you have an event. A typical ransom range from uh, 41,000 to 600,000. We have a, um, a customer now that is a county, uh, Montgomery County, so they were well publicized that they had a breach a couple years ago. Um, their ransom work was in the $50,000 range. Um, they ended up having to pay that, brought us in after the fact, um, and have done a lot of things to, to get themselves out of that, so that hopefully that never happens again, but gives you an idea. Um, City of Florence, 
was another target earlier this year, and their ransom I think started at three hundred sixty thousand. So um, it it varies depending on the group that's in there. Um, what that ransomware could actually be, or what that that ransom could be. Um, average cost for a small to medium business of downtime one hundred forty thousand dollars. So think about okay, I've had a ransomware attack. I'm locked up. How many days am I going to be locked up? Which you'll see at minimum two days to get your files back. And the cost of $140,000. So you have to ask yourself, can I afford to be out of business for at least two days? Um, we have another county in the state right now that's going through some issues and they've been down for two months. So can you afford that? And then can you afford the cost that's going to come from that? Depending on the, the, the incident um, and the size, eight million, depending on the size, to recover from a ransomware incident. So, and then we'll get into reasons why behind that in a few, a few minutes. I did put a resource here, uh, Datto.com. So, Datto is a, a vendor that provides backup services for your computer, servers, network appliances. They are very good. Um, they're not cheap, but they have different packages available so that you have daily backups outside of your network into a cloud environment. They even go as far as having the ability to spin up a, if you have an, uh, an application or a server that's very critical, they have the ability to spin that up in the cloud if you had an outage. Outage could be not just a cybersecurity event, right? It could be a tornado, a fire whatever that could come through to blow it away but um, they actually have a the slash rto they actually have an ability to you can enter some of your information and it will give you a kind of a breakdown of what it would cost you to have their services and then also what it would cost for you in downtime i mentioned attacks in alabama so um i pulled some of the ones that are public knowledge um, out and most of these are large some of the ones that I'll point out, Chilton County, I talked about them a minute ago, they're still not back up. It's been almost two months and they still don't have everything back up. City of Florence, um, I think is back in business, but um, has already spent a significant amount of money um, to bring a firm in to help them. And then also they had to pay the ransom. I mentioned Montgomery, that happens to be one of our customers. Um, DCH Re Regional Hospital in Tuscaloosa made big news uh, a little over a year ago that. You know, they were totally shut down and we're having to send patients to UAB um, for their issues and then school systems a couple school systems have been hit again those are large companies right and I, we we could list this page for days so I just don't want to see anybody else on that page right so that's that's a, a very personal sticking uh, uh, point for me so why is it so expensive First, you must identify the source of the attack, right? So you come in, all your systems are down, it's gonna be haywire, you gotta figure out what happened, where where that is occurring, then you've gotta stop it. Well, how are you gonna stop it, right? So if you don't have an IT staff or an experienced vendor that you know and can trust, that's gonna take some time and possibly a cost. After the attack is stopped, then you need to fix it. Right, so what do you got to do to fix it? Is it going to be forklift upgrades of systems, or is it just going to be minor patching? And then you've got to worry about, um, you know, doing the forensics to see if you've lost any data. Now, obviously, if it's a ransomware attack, you're going to have to make up the decision of do I pay the ransom or just try to, you know, pull myself out of this without paying the ransom. One thing I will say there is uh, we have seen in the past that. Just because you pay the ransom and they send you the decrypt key, which basically unlocks your files, doesn't mean that's going to work, right? So we've actually seen uh, in real life the decrypt key didn't unlock some of the files because of the file name length. So the company actually called the hackers back or communicated with them and they're like, yeah, you can give us another 100,000 and maybe we'll see if we can get it to work, right? So they don't have a help desk is my is my point there, right? So there, there's no tech support when, when you're in that scenario. So, um, and again, these guys are criminals, right? So they're not, 
they're not Robin Hood, right? They're criminals for a reason. So things to take into account. The other thing after the forensics are done, you've got to de decide if you lost customer data, and if so, what customer data did you lose? And do you have to notify those customers? And now in the state, kind of going back to the Breach Notification Act, if it's more than a thousand customers, you've got to let the attorney general know. So that that starts that snowball rolling of cost and cost and cost. So then you have to decide, do I have to provide monitoring software for those customers? So that's that's another key cost that gets real expensive real quick. So in the room or on the phone, um, cyber insurance, does anybody have any? I do, this is Belda. Okay. So one thing that we always remind, especially our medical customers, um, I don't know if we have medical on here, but oh, typically they will have a rider in their, um, like their liability insurance that, that says, you know, you get $50,000 for a cyber incident or things of that nature. Um, I will tell you $50,000, it may get you two, three days. It, it's gonna go fast. Um, one of the other things that insurance companies are having a hard time figuring out how to write it, how to price it, how to cover it. Um, most of them will give you some specifics that you have to meet. Most of those specifics are, are your machines patched? Have you had a risk assessment? Are you sure that your network's as safe as it can be? Um, that's an interesting time right now to, to try to figure that out if you had to use it. Um, and, and price varies. Uh, there's a couple of big companies there that, that offer that type of service. Um, and depending on obviously your size of your company will depend on how much that's gonna cost you. But things to think about, but if you take it, don't think, oh, I'm covered. I don't have to do anything else, right? Just understand that there's a lot of fine lines to those, those type policies. So I uh, mentioned a risk assessment. What is the value of a risk assessment? So it is um, the central component for your security plan, okay? Now, I am, our philosophy again is, I'll happily do a risk assessment for you, right? I'd much rather have you as a customer that we're doing risk assessment for you, but I'm monitoring everything else going on day to day so that if something happens three months from now, you're not, you know, kind of hung out to dry, right? So my issue with a risk assessment is um, they can get pricey and I come in with a thousand sheets of paper and I put them on your desk and we talk about them and we line up what you need to fix and how you need to go about fixing it. And then I walk out the door and then you're stuck looking at that piece of paper, right? So cybersecurity is already a, a, a mental issue, right, of, of the fear of, am I doing things right? Do I need to do more? And then you have a company come in and deliver a report and it really scare you to death, right? And then, so we see some companies just kind of tuck in the hole and afraid to do anything, right? So you're, you're stuck on go. So um, that's my one issue with a cyber or risk assessment, but if you're gonna have one, what should it deliver? I talked about asset discovery earlier. That's the first thing that you need to know. What devices are connected to my network? What devices may have paths outside my network to home, to somebody else's network? So those are things now, with everybody working at home, coming in through VPN, those are things to take note of. If you're working with a, a managed services provider, they should be able to securely have your work, remote workers accessing your internal network if they need to through a secure VPN, um, separate segmented network so that if I have something break out at home, it can't transfer into the corporate environment. Uh, potential threats, um, risk assessment should identify any threats such as old devices on the network, old applications running on those devices. It sounds crazy, but we've seen so many printers uh, come in out of the box, plug the printer in, fire it up, and then it starts talking to um, a country outside the US, right? Um, not necessarily malicious, but my question is why? 
right? So we don't we don't want that to happen. So those things that you need to identify so that you can turn specific settings off on your printers. Also put security on the printers. It sounds crazy, but I can, printers are smart enough now, they're basically a computer to themselves, so I can use that as an access point to get in and communicate and pull data out. Um, vulnerabilities, obviously this kind of goes hand in hand. It should show you any vulnerability that you have in the environment and how to mitigate that vulnerability whether it's old machine, application, um, specific code application that needs to be adjusted, that, that should provide that in that plan. Compliance plan, um, show, well, as good as we can do, show of hands, how many people have policies and procedures in their environment? I know y'all do. Okay. So if I come in and do a risk assessment and you have no policy and procedure, how do I know that Dale's not supposed to be accessing the HR records? How do I know that Dale's not supposed to be able to go to a website in China, right? Um, or any acceptable use for any device, right? So that again is a, a core foundation. It doesn't have to be a thousand page legal document. It can be short and sweet for your organization, but that risk assessment should take that into account and I should read that. Yeah, Will? Okay, perfect, awesome, obviously. Uh, so, and same with, with Velda and, uh, and Raven, there's a regulatory requirement for them. So they have to have that. So, and that's something that should be reviewed at least yearly, okay. Um, impact of threats and mitigation steps. So whatever the findings are on the risk assessment, um, for an example, for us, when we do a risk assessment, when I first deliver it to the customer, it's always got draft written all over it because that's my third party take on the scanning and the reporting that I've done in that environment. That doesn't mean that my word is the gospel, right? It could be the fact I see this as a risk and then I, I write that down and then we talk through it and I understand, okay, well, no, that's how they have to do business. So then we go in and readjust that before we give the final copy. Um, but every risk should have a mitigation plan around it. And I would caution you on a company that comes in and can sell you more services, right? So obviously I supply cybersecurity services and all of my customers know that before I go in and if I'm just doing a risk assessment, but be cautious of a company that comes in and does a risk assessment and says, oh man, I can sell you these printers, it'll take care of your problem. I can upgrade all your hardware machines, it'll take care of your problem. Maybe you need, you need that, right? But make sure that that's not the only goal of exposing. It's not just to expose so I can make more money, it's so that you're protected and your network is gonna be as strong as it can be. Um, finally, just to give you guys an example of cost. I see numbers all over the place for risk assessments. Uh, a lot of it depends on your size of business. Um, but with that said, I've seen some much higher numbers than where we start at. And, uh, and typically an assessment for us is around $2,500. That should be yearly depending on your regulatory requirement. But that's where we fall. And that doesn't mean that we're the best, doesn't mean that we may be the cheapest, but just to give you guys an actual number around um, some of the things that we do. So what do you need to do? So we talked about quite a bit. Again, I'll go back to policy and procedure. If you don't have a policy or procedure, you don't know that what you're doing is gonna try to keep you safe, right? And if you don't tell your employees, hey, you can't click everything, you can't go to every social media site, you can't do these things, when they do them, and if they cause a problem, how do they know, right? How do they, how do they know I wasn't supposed to do that, right? So um, along with policy and procedure, also pulls in the training aspect of that. You can't preach enough, don't click on things. Uh, we actually, to be kind of funny, um, use a tagline of don't click on and I told you I wouldn't go use bad language but don't click on in a four-letter word right Will so um, you know 
it, to, to be funny with it, but to try to drive that point home of make sure before you click something or before you enter your credentials into something, you are knowing for sure what you're trying to do. Firewall, talked about that earlier. Um, if you can't afford anything else, you've got to have a firewall. Um, it needs to be a quality firewall, something that is, is business quality. It doesn't have to be enterprise grade, but there's a lot of really good firewalls that are in that thousand dollar range that are not going to cost you a ton, but give you good quality service. Antivirus. I'm not going to ask if anybody ha doesn't have antivirus on their machines, and I'm talking personal and business, but you have to have an AV. Uh, that is also, security is kind of like different fences or different ways to get into your house, right? So if you've got a fence, you lock the fence. You've got a door, you lock the door. If you've got windows, you lock the windows. And if you can afford a video cam camera system around your house, you've got that right. So your network's no different. So have as many barriers to entry as you possibly can. Um, AV, again, you've got to have it. There's just, there's no options around that. Spoke about backups earlier. Um, again, Datto is a good brand. I know there's a couple of companies here in town that, that offer a couple of other options outside of Datto. Explore them, do your due diligence on them. If you've got questions, hit us up. Um, we don't sell that stuff for a reason. I go back to look at who's coming in to talk to you or look at who's coming in to sell you something. I'm not in that business to sell that, that type of equipment, but I will give you an honest opinion on that and also give you an honest opinion on the price. You know, is it something that's going to fit for your, for your uh, needs? Finally, if you can afford it, an option like we provide, which is monitored security services, um, continuously. So I'm not reading your emails, things like that, but we are able to see potential threats happening within your network and alert to them and then control on them. So we have several packages available that literally go from, depending on your size and your needs, $100 a month, right? So I mean, we, we drove it down that far uh, for a specific reason, because again, I want small to medium business protected. Any questions before I hit the this is the last slide and I'll shut up? It's okay. It's okay. Um, I'm using a Mac, so you know I typically beat up on Microsoft a little bit, but they've come a long way. Okay, so personal machine, yeah, I think you're okay with that. Just always keep that cautionary mentality um you can download things like um malware bytes uh so you can run that periodically it's free so you run that periodically and just see do i have anything going on it is crazy to think that um i go back to that bank of america slide right to where there's one letter off um and actually i will make a point here when you google something and you have the first couple of returns from Google that are ads. Don't click on those, right? Google doesn't doesn't control that, right? That's who's paying enough money, who's getting the clicks enough to put that ad there. That could very well be the company that you're looking for, but it could also very well be somebody trying to do something malicious. Sure. Um, so security, Essentials is okay for a home machine. I will make that point. Home machine, yes. If you're a business, much like I said, you need a firewall, you need some type of a paid antivirus system to protect yourself. Probably not what you want to hear, but you need that protection. Um, and there's a lot of options there. And again, price points are all over the board. If you have specific questions on that, hit us up. We'll give you an honest. Uh, answer to that. But back to the, the ad point for Google, right? So you take one of those ads, it may or may not be that company. As we looked at the Bank of America slide, oh yeah, it looks like Bank of America, I'm gonna click it, but it actually takes you somewhere else. Um, it brings up a page, you think, oh man, I hit something wrong. You X out of it or you back up, 
but it's actually downloaded something in the background that you don't see, right? So it's, again, not a scare tactic, but those are things to remember and look out for so that you don't do that and you don't fall victim to that potential. Um, kind of beat this up, but security is not static. So you've got to be diligent. Um, threats happen continuously. They happen at any time. Um, and they're going to prey on your ability to miss them or being in a hurry and click on something that you shouldn't, right? So is what that comes down to. Uh, be adaptive. Um, again, the things we see daily change daily. They change by the minute. They change by the hour. So it is a continual battle, battle to see the new uh, issue, find the new issue, and try to protect our customers from that. So keep that in mind have a firewall, have endpoint security, um, and then comprehensive. So no device in person can be trusted, right? Anything could happen. Um, you cannot spend enough time with your employees stressing, don't click on things, or here's triggers to look for, or make sure you're understanding what you're trying to do um, before you take that option to click. And then the, the wind not it, right? So it's gonna happen. There's gonna be an issue there. Your key is, do you have the proper controls in place? Do you have the proper systems in place to identify that and to take, take that risk on and mitigate it as fast as possible before it causes a bigger issue? Any questions? And I always leave, leave with a slide just to be kind of funny. You don't wanna be this guy, right? Because you put your head in the sand, you leave other things exposed, and then you get in trouble, and then you're paying a lot of money for something that you shouldn't have to. So spend the money up front if you can, find a company that you trust, and hopefully we never have to talk about what happened in my business. So. Any other questions? Sure. Um, uh, this is Sure. Great question. Great question. So, just to make sure that everybody heard that on the call, the question was what I recommend for um, disposal of old machines, especially machines that may not even turn on anymore. So, um, find a company. There's several companies, especially local, that will destroy them for you. So they'll take the hard drives out and physically destroy them, crush them, um, and then they'll give you a piece of paper that says, I've taken these machines, I've crushed these hard drives. Some of those companies, if the machine is, is good enough to be salvaged, will donate them so that all you gotta do is put a hard drive back into them. Um, so those are, those are your safe options. But make sure if you do that, that you get that piece of paper from that company that says, I have destroyed them completely. So before we call it quits today, guys, um, I know Velda had a few comments she wanted to make. Velda, would you like to unmute yourself and uh, pop that up for us? Absolutely. Can you hear me? Yes. Again. Well, I wanted to say thanks again, Chad. <clears throat> Gosh, that was very, very good information. I knew it would be. And hearing it again just uh, solidified that we still have more work to do. I wanted to tell everybody on the call today or in person that our next topic that we are sponsoring is going to be small business retirement options. That will be on December the 1st. And I have um, gotten Logan Green, who's the Director of Planning and Operations at our firm. He'll be coming from Nashville to talk about those options. And so I hope to see you all then. Maybe we can be there in person. So. Again, thank you for attending, and I pray everyone stays safe. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for letting me do this. Bill, thank you for the kind of words. So thank you again to Eugenius for sponsoring this year's uh, series and Chad for joining us today. Uh, before you guys that are on the call right now, before you sign off, I'm going to go ahead and stop this recording really quick. Uh, you can find a recording later today on our website at uh, etowahchamber.org forward slash COVID-19. Uh, but before we actually leave today, I'm going to stop the recording.